Hey folks, if anyone's listening, you can see I've got, oh, I haven't got any viewers yet. I won't talk to you if I haven't got viewers. Oh, thanks for joining us. If anyone's logging in live online, um, as always, I am really happy to, to see when people are coming on this journey with me live. There's a few folks on YouTube watching. That's great. Thanks, folks. Really nice to have you here. Starting any minute now. Just give me a few minutes for people to join in. <laughs> a couple of folks on, uh, someone on Twitch. Thank you, Twitcher. Great to have you. I need something. I need something. I'll be back in a minute. Back in a well, how would you know I'm back in a minute? I'm just walking around the house. How would you even know I'm in a house? I might be in the cloud, in server land, in the internet tubes. I could be anywhere. Now I'm back in the studio, in the lab. do that again so I catch the catch it in my recording whoops catch start recording <laughs> back to intro g'day folks thank you for joining me here this morning Monday week 12 11 a.m. for this the last lecture of comp 1720 slash 6720 for 2021 and what a journey it has been over the last 12 weeks or 14 weeks really, including the break. We have covered JavaScript coding, coding in P5, looked at lots of different types of art. We've had um, you know, discussions about what makes an interactive artwork, talked about understanding the, the viewer's perspective of a computer program, a computing system, as well as an artwork, um, and really gotten deep in on some very important um, discussions about the nature of, of computing art, interactive art, 
and, and that what, what that means to us in amongst all the other media which we consume in our everyday life. I'm um, just checking to see what's going on with my streams. Everything seems to be live and happy. Got a few folks on Twitch and YouTube now. Thanks for, for um, you know, coming, making time to, to join me here this morning <laughs> for the, this week 12 lecture. I know that things do tend to get a little bit hectic, heckers, in week 12. So I do appreciate it. Today we've got a, a really exciting topic, a topic which I love. Creative machine learning and generative AI in in art as it relates to P5.js. Why is this an important topic to me? Well, I think that my experience as an, a performer has been deeply involved in how humans move and interact and use gesture to perform and control complicated musical instruments and have deep understandings of, of how their gestures control a complex system, a musical instrument, but also how they communicate with an audience, with viewers. So I'm interested in not just the computing systems that make up um, uh, interactive art, interactive music systems, but also the, the motions and learnings that humans bring to that experience. So that means that for me, um, the one of the very important things about a interactive performance or interactive art situation is complicated human data, complicated human data. Complicated human data is what we can sense when, an, when a user is interacting with a system. We might use simple sensors like a keyboard or a mouse that you've been working with in this course or more complex sensors such as cameras, motion sensors, uh, accelerometers, um, the, the many different sensors which we have available to us these days and can hook into computers and apply within our artworks. Now one of the, the, the things which is really fascinating to me is how we deal with the data we get from these sensors. It's complicated data. It's data which is unpredictable, which, which moves in different ways, which may have many dimensions. Uh, and we have to deal with it somehow and understand it and use that understanding to make our artworks more engaging. And one of the best tools we have for, for making, uh, for understanding this data now is machine learning. I'll talk a bit more what that means, but, but fundamentally we're using computers to, uh, to understand complicated data automatically. So we give them some complicated data, we tell them, the computer, what we want uh, it to see in that data, what it's looking for at a high level, and then it works out the exact program to do that for us, which is really, really interesting. Another aspect of machine learning is that once we can understand data with a machine learning system, we can often create more of it, and that's the generative, generative AI part. And that, that is something which I've been using in my artistic practice using the generation of new data like human data, new complicated data that looks like it was created by a human, using that to engage a, a viewer, engage a performer and create something really unique. So now I've given the, the personal, personal spiel about this, this fascinating topic, uh, creative machine learning and generative AI, which by the way, I could teach an entire course on this. This is a, a deep and interesting topic which raises lots of questions, which is very unknown, very cutting edge. We don't know what is possible with this technology yet, even though it's been, been um, it has a history of exploration for 30 years, it's still something which is, uh, seems like the potential hasn't been reached yet. And there's a lot of new exploration and new ground to explore. We don't have a whole course, we have one lecture. So I'll give you a few overviews about what machine learning means, about how we can use this in P5 and use it in interactive art, should you choose to. And I'll give you some examples of what I think are some of the very interesting applications of machine learning and generative AI in, in interactive art right now. So let's get our coffee out. I've got my, my espresso. It's time for our admin corner. I'm not gonna say a lot today, we have had 13 weeks so far of this course. 
with me very much hammering you folks about what um, getting prepared for your assignments and most recently in the last few weeks about getting prepared for your major project. Now it is up to you. You've, you we've, we've prepared you um, through these many, many labs, many labs to identify your ideas, refine them, add stuff in, take stuff out, think from different perspectives. We've looked at all of that. Now it's time for you just to, to get the work done, uh, realize your vision. Um, there's still time for asking questions in your labs this week. Um, but I'm mostly interested in making sure that everyone knows that the major project will be due at 9 p.m. Australian time, Australian Eastern Daylight Time, UTC plus 11, next Monday. That is the deadline of the assignment. If there is any issues, if anyone has um, a, an emergency coming up or something's gone wrong for them and they need more time, I expect you to get in touch with me for an extension rather than keeping quiet, especially keeping quiet until the very last minute. Um, I'm st still looking forward to seeing discussions on the forum. I'm still hoping that you attend your lab this week and you bring your major project and want to engage your tutors in discussion about it. But we've reached the end of our accessible labs. The lab this week isn't accessible. It doesn't have a pre-lab task. It's simply a time for you to bring your major project and discuss it with the tutors if you want to. Um, and that's our admin corner. Last admin corner for the semester. Isn't that great? We've, we've made it this far. So, <laughs> creative machine learning with ml5.js. Here's the three questions we're going to talk about. What is machine learning? How can I use machine learning in P5? Three, how can we make art with this? I suppose the three, we, we don't answer that correct, that much because, again, it would take a whole course to get into this in great detail, but we can talk about the first two and, and start to get an, an, a surface idea of number three. What is machine learning anyway? You might have heard this term machine learning. You might have heard a term artificial intelligence. You might have read articles in the newspaper or The Guardian or um, you know Tech Insider or something or just heard it on the radio, people talking about machine learning and AI. What are these things? Well, I'm, I'm going to specifically talk about the machine learning part today. Um, AI is a big field with many ways of making computer systems that behave in what we would think of as an intelligent way, intelligent-ish computer systems. Machine learning is something which is more concrete. It's, it's a way of using computers to automatically create an algorithm based on some complicated data from the real world. So this is the fundamental concept of machine learning, creating computer programs without explicitly programming them. So we want the computer to learn its own program from some experience in the real world. Creating computer programs without programming them. Another way of putting this, algorithms that learn by example, like how a human learns. Um, if I give you some examples of a certain thing I want you to do, Probably after seeing the examples, you'll be able to do it if it's a simple task. If it's a complex task, maybe you need to add some other way of, of approaching that learning. Just example might not be good enough. Algorithms that learn through experience. So that's not the same as learning by example, is it? That's more like you're doing a task, you evaluate your results, and you improve the next time. That's how a human learns as well. That's how you've learned in this course, doing assignments evaluating the results and improving your, your, your work next time. Machine learning is kind of a big deal and that means dollars, dollars, dollars because everyone wants to understand complicated data in the real world. If we have a way of doing this reliably then um, businesses think I can make money out of this. There's a way to make money out of it. Kind of problematic! Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. We will discuss some ways in, in which machine learning can be a problematic, um, com problematic topic in the world, a problematic phenomenon. Um, and it's related to the dollars, 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 really. You know, often things that involve three dollar signs will also <laughs> involve three exclamation marks of problematicness, because money is often entwined with problematic things. 
Let's do a machine learning problem. Let's solve a problem. So suppose, suppose that the boss wants a program where the screen color changes to red when the mouse moves to certain locations. And you know, the boss is not going to make this easy. The boss is just going to give you a list of examples um, of what background we should have in our program and where the mouse is going to be. Okay, so if the mouse is at mouse X is at 15, the, the background should not be red. If the mouse X is at 75, then it should not be red. If mouse X is at 173, it should still not be red. But now if the mouse X is at 250, it should be red. 312, yes, it should be red. 375, yes, it should be red. Okay, so we've got these, these certain locations. And the question is, how are we going to solve this as a programmer? We've got this specification from our boss. Well, let's give it a go. We've got a canvas here, 400 by 400. We've got our background, 220. And we can change the background to be red, 25500. So now it's red all the time. And now I only want to make it red under some certain circumstances. So you know how to do this. We put in if mouse x, I don't know, less than something. Less than 15 or just or, or 100, I'll put in a, just a number. So we've got if statements, we learned about those in week four. They don't serve, so um, don't cause any problems for anyone in this class anymore. So if mouse x is less than 100, we're red, and if it's not, it's gray. Are we meeting the specification that the boss has given us so far? Well, no, because if mouse x is 75, we need the background to not be red. In fact, we only want the background to be red if it's above, if it's greater than or equal to 250, it would seem. So from this data, we can learn a rule, which we put into our sketch. So here's the rule. If it's greater than, well, put greater than 200, it should be red, and otherwise it's, it's gray. So this was our rule. If mouse x greater than 200, background is red. That solves this one. That's a big tick. Tick. 75, no. Red background, tick. 173, background, no. Tick. 250, that's greater than, greater than 200. This is our kind of boundary where we're changing to red. Tick, tick, tick. So I think we've solved the problem with a very simple algorithm. So we've learned from some data and created a, a sim used our knowledge of how to do um, the, the if then else structure in P5 to make a simple decision based on this data. So far so good. This is a simple kind of learning problem. We could generalize this by calling this algorithm a configurable algorithm. If mouse x is greater than something in question marks, then we change the background to red. And all we have to do is then solve where that, that question mark should be. I wonder what that, where that leads. Oh, it leads to my, my test sketch. So we only have one decision to make here. Is it a red background or a black background? And we only have one input, mouse x, one number as the input to our problem. So this means that because it's one decision and one input, it's very easy to develop this configurable algorithm. And you could imagine that we could write a computer program which would all automatically solve this problem no matter what data the boss had given us for when the screen should change to red it can figure out where what what number should be within those question marks here so it should be something which is fairly easy for our system to solve but what if we had more inputs what if we had more inputs maybe if we had more inputs more data coming in we could make more complicated decisions so if we only have one, one piece of data coming in, one number, it might be hard to make a decision based on that, but we could make more complicated decisions with lots of inputs. But it's also likely to get more complicated to configure the algorithm. If we had five input numbers instead of one, we'd have to have a lot more ifs, right? <laughs> to cover all of the possibilities. So the, 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 the configuration would be more complicated and it might be a more difficult process to solve the problem. And it might start to get too hard for a human 
to do it just off the top of their head like I was doing just then. So the next thing I want to pose to you, the next thing, is that rather than taking inputs as just a number, we actually use a picture as an input. And as you know, as you know, a picture is a data structure in when you load it into P5 it's a data structure of pixels. And each pixel is has a color and that color has a red, green and blue value. And that's what makes up a picture on our screen. So this picture has many pixels across and many pixels down. It's a large 2D array of pixels, each with those red, green and blue inputs. So if we wanted to make a decision based on an image as an input, we could represent the image as that 2D array and each, each element in the array is a, a, a array of three elements, the RGB um, values. So then we've got a lot of numbers as inputs. And in fact, this is actually what happens in a lot of machine learning algorithms which are very popular uh, at the moment, which is these computer vision algorithms. So they treat images as a big list of numbers and try to make a complicated decision about that. What kinds of decisions do they make? One of the most important ones is what is in a picture. So we'd like a computer to be able to see a picture and tell what it is. Um, more complicated decisions might be if there's multiple images in, in objects in a picture, where are they? Where are they moving to? What are the outlines of them? This might be useful supposing if you had a, a, a car um, and you'd like to have a safety camera at the front so it could detect if there was um, a car that you're about to run into, it could apply the brakes. So it can make a simple decision, do I apply the brakes or not? But it's a very important decision because it's one that could save someone's life if they were in an accident. Um, applying the brakes automatically if you're about to run into the car behind you, uh, in front of you. So there's, there's many ways of taking the, this, many approaches to taking the complicated input from a, a picture and turning it into a decision. And we're gonna look at one of them not in great detail, but just in, I suppose, shallow detail soon. So as I said, pictures are 2D arrays of colors. These are represented as numbers. And if we had enough ifs and elses, maybe we could make an algorithm which would understand what is in the picture. And in this image, we've got a doggo. So perhaps potentially we could understand if there's a doggo there or not. So just a little bit of detail about how we might do this. In, within machine learning, a trick we often use is to define, design configurable algorithms that are more complicated than the one that I designed on the previous slide. Configurable algorithms that can take lots of numbers as inputs. Here's some numbers here. One number, two number, three, four, five. And then boil this down just to one number as out, the output. So here's the output number. For some reason my pen doesn't work at the edge of the screen. I don't know why. Um, so we take lots of numbers as input, make some complicated decision and, and just get one number output. And in fact, actually doing this is not so hard. There's a simple way of, of doing this. Um, you create this configurable algorithm that in some sense chooses how much of each input to listen to. So it's going to weigh the inputs against each other, just like a judge may take evidence in a case and weigh it up against. Some, some evidence may be more important, some is less important. And we weigh this evidence in order to make a decision. In this case, the evidence is not a complicated thing in the real world, it's, a, it's just a number. Just like we had mouse x as just one number. So an example of a way to do this is called a perceptron. And in fact, it's a rather old idea. The perceptron concept was invented in the 50s, 1958, and it's the idea really is just to take each of these numbers and multiply them by a weight. Weight one, multiply by weight two, multiply by weight three, multiply by weight four, multiply by weight five. And then we add up what we've got and then we get one number out. That's our output. That's a simple way of taking some evidence adjusting it to fit whether we think some bits are more important or not, and getting an output. So that was the idea in the 50s. As it turns out, over the last 50 years, or 60 years in fact, 
a few tricks have been invented to make this idea work better. Make this idea work better. The first trick is to take the outputs of perceptrons and feed that into more perceptrons. And you make a kind of network of perceptrons. So here's some, some inputs. I've got my same five complicated inputs, uh, five simple inputs that make one big complicated input. They're all going to three different perceptrons, which might make different, simplify the data in some way. The outputs of those three are going to another layer of three perceptrons, then another layer of three perceptrons, and then finally we get an output, a single output. It turns out that that works better. We get what's called a multi-layer perceptron system, or another word for these perceptrons is a artificial neuron. So we get what is called an artificial neural network within a computer, a very common term these days. The second trick is to have tricky algorithms to choose the configuration. So we, I didn't give you any way to choose what these weights were going to be. Weights are all of these little lines representing some number being multiplied to our input. We don't have a way to choose that, but there are many ways. They're called optimization algorithms that, that have tricky ways of figuring out how to get the best configuration for this algorithm. And then the third trick is to have big, fast computers. They didn't have big, fast computers in 1958. They had big, slow computers, <laughs> very big, slow computers um, with not much data. But now we have big, fast computers and lots of data. We've got a whole internet full of data to learn from. So we got, have many examples available to, to use to help teach our algorithms. So that's the difference between now and 1958. Um, we're not really smarter than they were. We just have a lot more experience with, with dealing with these configurable algorithms, a lot more data, better computers, and experience with the, uh, the configuration process. By the way, this is this other name for the perceptrons and artificial neuron. So the above is a neural network, um, a common term in machine learning. A little bit of terminology before we go into trying this out in our, uh, trying out some examples, a model, What's a model? Not just like someone um, having clothes, fashionable clothes on a catwalk. In this case, in machine learning, a model is an instance of a training, trainable algorithm, an example of a trainable algorithm. A pre-trained model is a trainable algorithm which has dot, 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 already been trained. That's handy. We don't have to train it ourselves. The training or optimization is a process of using training data, a list of examples that tells the algorithm what you want it to do, to make a trained model. So there's some, that's the algorithm which does the, um, chooses the configuration, the optimization algorithm. Prediction or inference is using a trained model to generate an output using unseen data. So we have the example data, that, that's data which the algorithm is, is used to create the algorithm or the, create the model. But then we really test these systems when we show it some data it has never seen before and if it gives the output that we expect, then that's good. If it gives the output we don't expect, that would be bad. Very true. Um, Gina's reminded me that the first perceptrons were analog computers, not, um, not digital computers. That means that they used um, electrical signals that were moved by hand on a, a variable resistor and motors to represent the outputs. Um, and that's how a lot of computers were in sort of the World War II era. Um, computers were used in World War II to do calculations related to, um, to weapons, firing weapons and shooting a long way or doing complicated navigation calculations. And they were often mechanical systems, not electronic systems. So the, the final term here is this classification term. So that's when a machine learning algorithm chooses a class or a description for a piece of data. So the input data might be a picture and it tells us what the picture has in it, but it's not telling us that from scratch. It's just telling us from maybe a list of possible outputs. It might have a very long list, maybe a thousand, but it can't, it can't classify it as something that hasn't been told about. So it's just doing a very simple task of choosing from one of 1,000 options rather than inventing the word for dog or something from scratch. Wait a minute, where's all the maths? We're doing machine learning today. I need to have like a big sigma sign or something, surely. 
You can't, surely you can't do machine learning unless you've got maths which is too complicated to understand. Well, it's true that if you want to work on making learning processes faster or more efficient, it's a great idea to have a maths or CS major. But if you want to make interesting art with the most relevant new technology of today, everyone in this class is ready to do that. You don't need to have already studied machine learning to make interesting art with it. Um, there's lots of ways that where machine learning systems have been made very accessible to, to programmers who don't need to have um, a deep understanding of the maths in order to improve them. You have to know a little bit about how to use P5 and programming in order to apply them, which is a different skill set really. So now we'll talk about this, uh, this system called ML5.js, friendly machine learning. It's a JavaScript library separate to P5 which provides access to machine learning models um, for your P5 program. And it's, it's really useful. You can load up ML5.js, load up some pre-trained models, that is machine learning systems that are just going to work for you, and start doing predictions right away. You can start um, getting some output from these models. It's related to P5.js, it's separate, uh, but it's inspired by it in, in form and function, really. So here's the website for ML5. It's friendly machine learning for the web. A neighborly approach, I like that idea. A neighborly approach to creating and exploring artificial intelligence in the browser. Ah, lovely. So you can, you can look at this. It's, it's very artist focused, very P5 focused. Uh, we will use it a little bit over the next few slides. So now we're getting started. How do we get, how do we get, um, ML5.js working in our files, well, we just have to load it up in our index.html, um, just as you would add the P5 sound library. You can add this library to access ML5.js. And I've got a link here, if you want to check it out, to a web editor sketch with ML5 already loaded, which is handy um, if you want to get started with it. But we're going to do what I wanted to do before, which is classify some doggos. So for this example, we're going to use a pre-trained model called MobileNet. MobileNet, that's just the name of a, a machine learning model that someone else has created, someone else has trained it. So here's how we do it. Supposing we've got a P5 sketch, we've already got an image loaded up called image, and we wanna know what's in that image. Uh, we can load our um, ML5 image classifier and tell it we want this particular image classifier. There's many options within ML5.js. Then we tell, it, tell the system we want the classifier to classify an image. Here's the image input, and then there's this other got result parameter. And in fact, the got result parameter is what we call a callback function. And we've done that um, in previous lectures when we were looking at loading data from the internet. It's what you, it's a way of delaying getting this information back so that your sketch can keep going doing its drawing and get the information back when it's ready. So it might take a few seconds for the classifier to do this task to classify the image but once it's done we can the got result callback function will be called with the results. I'll show you how that works in this little experiment. So here's my image classification sketch. Let classifier let, do let doggo and our prediction will be some text and nothing yet is where it starts. So I'm going to load up a, do a doggo image, doggo equals load image asset slash doggo.jpg. I've got some doggo images in my assets folder. My classifier is going to be this one, ml5.image classifier mobile net. I'll create a canvas. Then I'm going to, in the setup part of the sketch, I'm just going to start that classifier working. Um, so it'll just happen once, just when I start loading the sketch. And then in my draw loop, all I'm going to do is um, display this image of the doggo and make some text to tell me what the prediction is. Now finally, I've got the got result callback function. So it's going to print the results for me in, in the console, as well as uh, grab the, the prediction result, the label, and put, add that into the prediction variable, and that means that in the next frame it will be written up on the screen. Okay, so, here we go. I don't quite know what's going on there, but anyway. 
So nothing yet. There's my doggo. Do, 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 do. Waiting for it to happen. Doing some classification. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Ah, and it says it's a fountain dog. What? That's not a fountain. <laughs> I don't know why I've got... Um... No, there's some issue here. Anyway. The... The machine learning system seems to have made a mistake. This is clearly not a fountain, it's a dog. Well, let's try it. In fact, we'll, we'll just have a look in, in this object. This is the result. It actually, the result of the classifier gives us three, the three most likely things that it could be. So we see that the most likely one is a fountain, which doesn't make sense, and the confidence is 8%. That's a pretty low confidence. The next one is a jigsaw puzzle, and the confidence is 6%. It doesn't look like a jigsaw puzzle either. And now we've got a park bench. Well, I suppose it, that could be possible. It could be possible that the leaves and the grass and the trees has kind of confused our system into thinking it's something to do with a park. So fountains occur in parks, park benches occur in parks. And jigsaw puzzles are often of parks, so that could explain that. So I've got a problem here. This one's not working very well. Why don't we try another dog picture? Because I've got some loaded up. I've got three doggo pictures in my, in my sketch. I'm just going to get doggo two. Load that up and we'll try it again. There's a dog. Ah, oh, Labrador Retriever. Well, that seems more likely, doesn't it? Indeed, it does seem like that's a Labrador Retriever. Confidation is 28%. It could also be a Golden Retriever. I'm not such a, I'm not, don't have a high level of dog knowledge, but isn't a Golden Retriever and a Labrador Retriever the same or similar? I don't know. St. Bernard, it's definitely not a St. Bernard, is it? That's only 3% likelihood. So, the, the, in this case, it does seem to have figured out that it's a dog, which is, is positive, isn't it? We'll try Doggo 3, see what happens here. Wait a minute, is that a dog? It's related to a dog, isn't it? Oh, a dingo! Well, that's smart, isn't it? It's not only worked out that it's not exactly a normal dog, but it's a um, a dingo, Australian native dog. It says it's a coyote, definitely not a coyote, definitely a dingo. Another uh, wild dog or a red wolf, it's definitely not a red wolf. Yeah, so this one is uh, seems like it's done very well. It's 46% likely to be a dingo. So. I guess, what, what lesson are we learning so far? Well, we've got this classifier, but it's not magical. It's not perfect. It seems to be working with some things, but not other things. And that potentially could lead us to have issues with our artwork, or it could give us opportunities, because we could be making art which is deliberately making fun of, of having the wrong labels for something. Um, I'm just gonna go back to my slides for a minute. Oh, I guess I will go to the classifying video in a minute, but I guess what I want to say, and we'll discuss this a bit more in a minute, is if we apply a critical approach to this system, what do we know? Well, we know that we've asked ML5 to provide us with an image classifier, and so far that's it. We don't know much else about this image classifier, and this is an important thing with machine learning systems because when someone gives you a pre-trained model, we really don't know how good it is, what it was trained on, and what the purpose, what its, its design goal was, really. So for the mobile net system, and for many image classification or publicly available image classification algorithms, they were designed with um, a, they were designed to be trained on a collection of images found on the internet, found for free. So there'd be big databases created of images. We'll talk about that in a minute. And in fact, many of the images which I've, I've put in here are ones I also found on the internet. And it could be that actually Doggo2 and Doggo3 were within the training set of the images that it was used to train MobileNet. So maybe it's the fact that it knows that this is a dingo could be because it was actually trained on that image and said, that's a dingo, remember that 
and now I've shown her the dingo, it's like, oh yeah, okay, dingo, I know this one, right? The first one, maybe it didn't see, it might be outside the training set, um, an image created later and put on the internet, and it's like, I don't know, is that a fountain? <laughs> like, and we're looking at it, we look at this algorithm and we see three dogs, the images are all the same to us, but the algorithm may have been trained with two of those images within the training set, and so in some sense it's cheating a little bit because it's already seen the answer to that one and been trained to produce that result with that specific image. Um, and the third image, that, or the first one I showed you, may not have been trained on that, so it makes a big mistake. Anyway, machine learning, not perfect, highly reliant on the data used to train it. I'm going to show you another one in a minute, which is classifying video. And this is where things get a little bit more fun, a little bit more fun because we can use our, um, we can use the, uh, the camera, the webcam in our system and continually make classifications about what is in that stream of, of, of data. So we can create a, a webcam object in our sketch that's easy enough, we create capture video, uh, make that a video object, we say video.size 320 by 240, we have to hide the video otherwise it's shown on the screen. Then we can simply give the video object to our classifier and tell it to classify one frame of that image. So this is, this is pretty fun. So this is going to, the reason I have this second line here is that that will classify one frame. And if we call that line again, it will keep doing it, keep accessing whatever is in the video object. So I'm gonna show you how this works. And in fact, I'm gonna show you on my other computer. <laughs> it's a bit complicated in this lecture because I need to have two computers in order to get this system to work correctly. But I actually have my second computer here, my laptop and I've got my sketch all ready to go. This is the video classification sketch. So you'll see I've got, I'm loading up mobile net again, just the same as we did last time. Image classifier, mobile net, vid. The vid is creating capture there. I'm going to set this up. Um, in the setup, I'll classify whatever frame the video has already captured. And then I'm going to draw that, each, um, each frame I'm going to draw the video and then present that text to it, text prediction. And I'm not going to do a classification in every frame because it actually takes a while to do these classifications and it would choke up, it, wouldn't, it would be trying to do too many. So I do a classification and then after every classification I do it again, do another classification after that. So we'll see how this goes now, I'm going to press go. Allow it to use my camera, yes please. I would like to use my camera, thank you. And there I am. And now I'm here twice. It's taken, seems to be working now. Oh, it's working very, working quickly now that it's loaded this system. Um, and it is seeming to think that I am a sweatshirt. Whereas it should obviously be saying Charles, which is not fair. Ping pong ball, sweatshirt. Let's try a few household objects. Oh, I forgot one, I've got one in the kitchen, I'll go get it for us in a minute. Microphone, not a microphone, no. Bassoon, syringe, no, absolutely not, but I guess that could look like a syringe. Electric guitar, no, not that. What about this? I'll just get myself out of the way. A seat belt, no, but cup, cup, we got one. We got one. And what about this cup? Cup, that works. It's, it keeps wanting to see a computer mouse, so maybe I'll show it one and see. It, it worked out mouse. Okay, we've seen a lot of images of computer mice. What about a phone? Will it see that? Cellular telephone? That's right, it is a phone. Pencil? Drumstick? I wish. Matchstick? No, it's too big to be a matchstick. Pencil box, pencil case, close, but not, not correct, right? Balloon? I suppose if the balloon was a duck, it might think that it's a balloon. 
So there's my, my video classifier. Um, obviously, it's not perfect either. But it's more fun, isn't it? Because we can show it a lot of objects and move them around the screen and really start to see that there's, there's differences even how you hold the object. It can see it in a different way. It's a bit weird seeing myself twice, so I'm just going to I'm going to close this. And I might go back to my slides for a minute. While we think about this, because we're going to be... Back to my slides on my other computer. We're going to be looking at, in a bit more detail, about um, these classifiers in a second, or perhaps look at how we can create our own classifier. So... We can access a webcam in our sketch. I showed you how to do that. We can use the classifier to just make predictions from this video stream. If you want to see my demo sketch or try it out on your system, which is pretty fun, really. Uh, I don't know why you wouldn't want to try this. There's the link. It'll be in the collection as well. So the question I, or I already discussed a little bit about this complex uh, concept that machine learning is dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, and problematic exclamation marks. But so far, I haven't seemed to do anything problematic, right? What is problematic about doggos? So the question we have to consider is, what is mobile net? We have loaded in a machine learning classifier without really knowing a lot about it. And it's quite a complicated algorithm. And as we know, machine learning algorithms were sort of guided by humans, um, but they're not all completely created by humans. They're created by this process of showing or using examples to optimize a configurable algorithm. And one of the big questions you can ask, a critical question of a machine learning system is, what was the training data? What was the training data? And what was it in MobileNet? Because MobileNet's too complicated. We can't look inside the, the code for MobileNet, the configuration, and discover how it was made. It's the, the relation to the training examples is, is something which we can only now find out by how it works in practice or by looking at the process of how it was created. So what was the training data? And here you're seeing uh, on the screen a, a list of words. And these are, in this, this list of words, there are a thousand different words, a thousand different classes that were used in the training selection of, of classes for this classifier. And the training data came from a, uh, a published set of images that are published along with a class that they ought to be, or what was contained in that image. And the, that, um, that training data set is called ImageNet, or it's one of the, the data sets under that title of ImageNet. And it could be problematic. One problematic thing is how were these images chosen? Were they downloaded randomly off the internet? Do they represent the kind of images that we would like to classify? The second pro potentially problematic thing is how were the labels chosen? Are the labels chosen or always accurate, right? If, if it's a dog, is it the correct breed of dog? Is it the correct type of dog? Um, are we looking at the what we see in the image? Was that what the person who chose the label saw if it has multiple things in it? So there's obviously there's many, many words here and there's many things here that we really never really need to know. I don't know what a coho salmon is, but I'm probably never going to use that, a picture of a coho salmon in an artwork. So maybe ImageNet and MobileNet itself, or the pre-trained MobileNet, is not exactly the right model for us if we wanted to, to be applying machine learning within our, our system. So it can be problematic. The, the higher level view is that we, we aren't always sure about how these models were trained, and they may have been trained to address a problem that we're not trying to solve. In this case of MobileNet, it was trying to cover a broad range of images, but we might just need to know a few things um, to use an image classifier within our artwork. Another thing to consider, and this is one that is more relevant in the last couple of years, is the potential that machine learning systems could have hidden costs. So they could be provided to you free in some sense, but it may, ha may be that the training process for a machine learning algorithm had an outsized carbon footprint, or it used a lot of um, electricity to generate this um, training, pre-trained model, and that electricity may have come from carbon-intensive generation processes. So in a country like Australia, 
much of our power comes from uh, coal powered power stations. We do have significant amounts that come from wind power, solar power, and from um, hydropower, which is fantastic, but still a lot coming from, from coal power stations. And I know that that is similar in many countries around the world. So the, the use of electricity to create a machine learning model has become more relevant as machine learning models get bigger and there's been some focus on using giant amounts of, of electricity, truly giant amounts of electricity to create them. Mobile net, this is, it's not so much a problem because the, the amount of uh, power used to create that algorithm is, is smaller um, than some of the higher profile systems, but there are some, some systems for generating text. An example is this GPT-2 system, which really had a very enormous carbon impact um, when you, if you calculate it. So we, uh, there are hidden costs to consider. That's part of, part of the trade-off of machine learning, um, part of what can make it problematic. Now we're gonna do a, our own custom image classifier, some artisanal bespoke machine learning, artisanal bespoke machine learning making our own custom image classifier with a system called Teachable Machine. Teachable Machine. Um, what is Teachable Machine? I'm just going to skip forward my slides and make sure this works. Oh yeah, now we can do this. Teachable Machine. Open it in a new tab. I'm actually going to go to my other computer to do this, but Teachable Machine is a system for training a computer to recognize our own, our own data not just the data which we've um, has already been shown to it. And the really exciting thing about Teachable Machine is that you can use this system, um, it's all in the web browser right now on this page, you can use this to train a machine learning algorithm with just with your browser. You don't need to have a special computer, you don't need to run GPUs, you don't need to use a lot of electricity to do it. The way that they do that is that they take a pre-trained model and modify it a little bit. So it's, it might be using something like MobileNet already. And once MobileNet has been trained on many images, you can then train it a little bit more with specific images that we want and get it to behave in the way which we want. So how are we gonna do it? Um, gonna go back to my other screen so I can actually get it to work. I might get another prop. You can just look at those GIFs for another second. Prop, 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 prop. I'll get two more props, walking around the house, picking up some interesting things. Uh, what have we got? Prop, 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 prop. Okay, I've got a whole collection of, of weird and wonderful objects right now. I'm going to, to go to the other screen. I'll load, load up the teachable machine first. Teachable machine. I hope I remember how to do it. <laughs> I hope I remember. Um, should be seeing my other computer, which is great. I can see Safari. I'm gonna get started. I'm going to make an image project. So there's a few options. You can, you can classify images, you can classify sounds, or you can classify poses, which is really cool. Pose classification is one of the really fun ones. The standard image model is what I want. You can use very, make a very small one, which even works on a, a microcontroller, which is very exciting. Standard image model. I'm going to make class one. It's going to be Charles. So I want it just to know when I'm there, obviously. Webcam. Allow, hold to record. So I'm just gonna be in the picture. Ooh. Okay, we've got a bunch of me. All right, class two is gonna be cup. I'll get out of the frame. A few more. Okay, out of class, um, ducky. Okay, and sheep. 
Boy, you're busy wondering, what's Charles going to come up with next? What's he got now? Here's a broccoli sheep. I don't know if it's going to be able to see that. Uh, there were some that were, that were bad. I don't care. I'm just going to now last class, last one. Banana. Ooh. Okay, we've got our classes. Now we're going to train. Do 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 Oh, I've got to think of that for a while, have some water, I think just imagine my way through a bit of Cat Empire training music. Oh, it worked! Ooh, it worked. So I got 100% Charles. Well, I'm just going to move myself, excuse me, over to this side so we can see the output here. 100% Charles, and now we're, it doesn't know, I think this is maybe a sheep, probably because it's green. If we get the sheep in, 100% sheep. 100% sheep, that's exciting. What about the cup? Oh, 100% cup? It seems to be working, folks. This is exciting times. 100% banana. No matter how I hold the banana, it knows that that's banana. That's very clever. What about the ducky? Oh, 100% ducky. This is working better than my wildest imaginings. Folks, what fun we could have with this when we put it into P5.js. And I bet you're wondering, how are we going to do that? Well, all I'm going to do is click Export Model. And in, flat, in fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, I can actually, it gives me the code to do it. Here's, here's the, the P5.js code, it's right there. There it is. It actually tells you what to do. This website, it's, it's almost cheating. Um, <laughs> but it's not cheating. In fact, I can just actually load it up and it will give me a, uh, my image model right in my sketch. So I just actually want to... I want to download my model for now. Download it. Yes, I want to download it. Come on. And upload? Where's it going to upload it to? Hmm, don't know. Get a shareable link in a minute. It's going to save it somewhere. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'm going to open up my um, my P5 sketch. I think I've got a. Here's the one I made last year. We're not going to need that one anymore. I'm going to make use my new one. Open that up. Over here, I've got my shareable link. Copy. Actually, I want my webcam to be turned off there. So I'm going to put in my, my new URL, my 2021 Teachable Charles model, which is pretty exciting actually. Um, there's my new model. I'm just going to make a, leave a comment after that. That's the 2021 Charles model. And this one down here is the 2020 Charles model. Alrighty, let's let's run this sketch again. I've got got everything set up just the same way we were doing it before. Hopefully it works. Hey, um, allow. Put myself back on the right hand side. It's going to come back. Ah, oh, there we go. Charles, it did it. It knows who I am. You really can't do better than that, can you? What about this? Cup. Oh, it works. Charles and Cup. Charles, Cup, Charles, Cup, Charles, Banana. It did it. 
What about the ducky? This ducky doesn't have a very good squeak. No, it's a, it's a pretty low squeaky ducky. I haven't found a good squeaky ducky. I suppose they need to have a little, have a little thingling in the, it's too bright to see it, but there's supposed to be a little thing in there which helps it to squeak. It almost squeaks without it, but probably they're dangerous because this is for my daughter. And she wouldn't know not to try to eat things that are small like that. So, uh, oh, test the sheep, of course. Sheep, it works fine. Sheep, 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 sheep. Charles, sheep, Charles. Cup. Yeah, it does the business. Well, we've played around with the, the teachable machine. I'll go back to my, um, my slides in a second. So what we've done, we've done image classification by itself. We've done video classification with a kind of untuned raw model straight from the internet. And now we have um, updated a machine learning model and made it very specifically for um, working with an image of myself, which is just, just exciting stuff. Just exciting stuff. I'm gonna go back to my slides for a sec. while I just load up my next, next idea. Now I'm gonna show you something quite completely different because right now, so far we have only worked with a classification algorithm. A classification algorithm, but, um, oh, save my sketch, sorry. Save, and I'm gonna add that to my, um, add to collection. 2021. So far we've only worked with models that classify images and give us some information about that image. And that is true, that is a very useful thing to do. You, there's many uses for that concept. But we have an, another kind of area of machine learning is using machine learning models to generate new artistic things. And one of the great things you can generate is drawings or new images, new music I'm really interested in, new gestures or poses. I'll show you something about that later. Um, and I'll just want to show you an, another kind of model that you can load into ML5.js called Sketch RNN. Um, and this is a model that generates by moving an imaginary pen, just like this pen, around the screen. So you'll essentially be moving the pen like the mouse and drawing lines, taking breaks, drawing new lines to draw a picture. So each, each prediction in rather than being the description of an image, it's gonna be a pen location in X and Y coordinates on the screen. So it's, it works really nicely with P5 because you can then just draw the output of this model and get it to draw new things. And that's what I'm gonna show you how to, how to do. So here we are back in P5.js. I've loaded up my a sketch RNN um, demo. And this time, instead of loading, um, loading up the, um, ImageNet model or an image classifier. I'm loading ml5.sketchrnn and there's many options available. I'm just gonna load this in a different tab. There's many options for the sketch RNN. I should leave that one. Yeah, I don't want that anymore. I'm back here. Don't want that. It's my, my web uh, stream view. So I'm streaming it to Microsoft Stream. These are all the types of sketch RNN models there's, the sketch RNN system was trained on a database of sketches made by humans of simple things. So there's a different sketch, a different model for each type of thing that the humans could be sketching. And there's a big list of them here, all these many things, peas, penguins, pigs, pig sheep, pineapples, pools, postcards, power outlets, rabbits, rabbit turtle. Gosh, I don't know what, ra maybe that's two things together. Radio face, tiger, toothbrush, toothpaste, tractor, trombone, truck. Everything, oh, every, we'll try everything in a minute. I've never tried that. So in this case, I'm just gonna load the cat model. So it just draws cats, trained on what people would do. And we load up this model, we start drawing, and the trick here is to generate predictions and then every frame draw what we've predicted. So as it, when it starts drawing it, it generates one stroke, starts in a random location on the screen, and then in our draw function, you can look at this in more detail later, 
we make a path, stroke that path, or, or draw the, the stroke for that path, and then we um, generate a new, a new stroke as part of our drawing. And actually the, the model knows when it gets to the end of a drawing. So if it gets to this um, end state, we start a new drawing and keep going with it. I wonder why I didn't tidy this. Has it been tidied? Oh, that looks better. Oh, it was tidied already. Okay, let's start it. We're going to draw something. I think it has to be... Oh, there we go. It's drawing in a random location. It's sort of drawing a cat and stopped. Oh, and make another one down here. That's cool. Drawing another cat. I'll move myself away from these cats so you can see them properly. So some of the cats are sideways, some of them are front on. The model had um, was trained on, I mean, people were just given a, a, um, a pen and told to draw a cat. So you might draw a cat in a different way. This cat seems to have a, an arm happening, which is pretty exciting. Well, we'll, tr we'll try another model. What are we gonna do? A radio, that might be fun. I'll try the radio model. So this is a very basic demonstration of how this works, but I can imagine that you could, you could use this in an artwork in some way. If you wanted to have a lot of, a lot of things drawn in your sketch, a lot of people, you could get SketchRNN to generate a lot of elements of your sketch as part of the background. It, but it would take a while for it to work um, because it does take a second to load. There's that radio, that one looks like a radio. It's got some sound lines coming out of it. That one's got two dials. What about another model? We'll do elephants. Oops, drawing, drawing one off the screen. That's a bit annoying. A little bit annoying. Oh, here's an elephant right on the screen. I think that's the trunk. Oh, it's got ears. It's working pretty well. It's a decent element. elephant. It's going to have legs. Yeah. So, well, it's only two legs. It could have had four. What about the everything model? I just don't know what's going to happen if I do that. Everything. I've done a lot of investigation with the sketch RNN models because I created a similar machine learning system um, related to predicting motions of a musician on a touch screen. So that would have to have the X location and the Y location of their, their finger on the touch screen, but also time because music is temporal. So the drawings in sketch RNN, they just happen all at once, essentially. There's no, the, we giving a dimension of time to this by attaching it to the frame rate but it could happen much faster or just generate all the predictions at once and draw the whole image. But in a, in a musical sense, there might be a big difference between a quick motion across the screen and a slow one. So we have to predict the time in between each movement as well. So the everything seems to be just drawing random stuff. People, elephants, not no, nightmares. <laughs> it could be anything, okay. We'll stop looking at Sketch RNN right now. We're going to look just a few details here. This was the line for loading up Sketch RNN. You can see that it's an another. Uh, it's a function of the ML5 library, a Sketch RNN. So the ML5 library has lots of example um, models available for you to test out. Lots of models available. Just have a look in the reference. Just like P5, it's a very similar website. Oh, the reference is gone. Got the wrong. Got the wrong website there, I'll fix that for you later. So there's all these different types of, of um, things. There's, these are different kinds of libraries. PoseNet, that figures out what your pose is. Hand pose, face mesh, face API, style transfer. Oh, I should have done a style transfer example. That'd be good for next time or next year, I suppose. Oh, cool. Wow, I didn't know they had this. Okay, I should try that later. Um, so style transfer, the idea of that is you can take a, 
a picture and give it the style of another picture. There's ways in which this works, which are kind of deep machine learning problems, but uh, it's a very interesting process. So you can take a picture like the Great Wave of Kanagawa and apply that to an image. I think this would be an image of mountains. Similarly, have this, this other abstract expressionist um, concept and add that to the same image and get a different result. That's pretty cool. Lots of different options here. Not too many generators. There's a car RNN can generate text. Um, I lecture about this when I talk about creative machine learning in general, but this would be really fun to try out um, as another way of generating, uh, just generating text as part of your sketch. If you want some text which is new for every user or uh, create something as they go along, this would be a fun way to experiment with it. Yeah, I'll try that later too. So now for the, the last part of this lecture, the second part, we'll just go through a few examples of how machine learning has been used in art or, or current AI techniques in art. And this reflects with the, the recent developments theme I've had over the last few weeks. Um, these are all recent artworks. So here's an example. Um, it's maybe not what you think of when you think machine learning art because often we, we see these very uh, famous image generation um, artworks. I've shown you some before, uh, ways of, of creating new images, which are quite, they're, they're interesting to look at, um, but they're getting, I think they're a little bit cliched now, actually, just a, sort of these weird images. Um, the, the shine has worn off them. But there are other things that you can do with generative AI. And a lot of people don't think about how to use text. Um, but there's an artist called Alison Parrish, who is in fact a poet. And Alison um, has created uh, poetry books, works of poetry, using a machine learning algorithm to, to create the words and create the ordering of words. So poetry is where is a, an art form where your choice of words has to be very, very precise. Very, very precise. Oh, someone sent me a cool link. I'll check that out later. Ooh. Um, so the, the choice of words is precise. And one of Allison's projects, this one called Compasses, is about creating new kinds of words that go between other words that exist in English. So there's four points of the compass here, phlegmatic, sanguine, choleric, and melancholic. Um, they're related to health and <laughs> um, kind of antiquated ideas about how health would work. And then Allison's system has created works in words in between those. So uh, generating these, um, these halfway points. So between phlegmatic and sanguine, there's shanknitin, and between sanguine and choleric, there's kalioni, and between melancholic and choleric, there's kalatic, and then between them all, there's kalentic. Really cool idea, um, and I think it's it's um, made some waves in the in the scene. This um, alternative way of using generative AI in a beautiful art form. Something fairly wild is this um, system called Relentless Doppelganger by a band called Dada Bots. Um, so Dada Bots are a, uh, a machine learning collective who have worked with generating new music. Um, I wonder where this sound's gonna come out. Oh. So you might be hearing this in the microphone right now. This is some um, some endless metal that data bots have created in their relentless doppelganger project. So they trained their machine learning algorithm on on many uh, different styles of music, and then they aim to produce a concert of endless music in that style. This is their endless metal example. And also, they got this just plays forever. It's been streaming for uh, years now. Infinite bass solo. They worked with a artist called Adam, Adam Neely to create infinite, <laughs> infinite bass solos. So, you know the the Dana Bot's aesthetic is this sort of wild zombie kind of creation, but it, they're very interesting because they work primarily with sound, 
and just separating the, the concept of musical production from artists, making it endless is something which is, um, is quite unique still, even though we've worked with generative, generative music for many years, but for very impactful works. The fact that they just stream it on YouTube forever is, is really something else. It's, it gives it that, that chef's kiss, the cherry on top is just, is using our, um, our mainstream media platform of today, YouTube, as a, or subverting that and turning it into an artistic um, vehicle for their work. Something really interesting here, this one's Mimo Atkins learning to see. I wonder if I can find a video of that to show you on my other screen. This is handy having two screens. Atkin learning to see. So, um, the, the concept with Mimo Atkins' work is to have this camera here, there's the camera and a little light, and it's looking at some objects, and you see it, the objects here, and then it's basically doing this style transfer to create um, a, recreate this image, or in applying um, what it's learned from other images around the world. So, so the, the machine learning algorithm is always reforming based on what objects there are in front of it, and it's trying to update them in, in the way that it can see. So it's a, a very, it's quite a detailed uh, system, but it's, it's really a fascinating way of using these machine learning systems, machine classification or image classification, image generation in an interactive sense, because often image generation in AI is sort of flat. You make the image and then you just put it on the wall in a gallery and say, look, a computer made this. Um, but what we, what is really interesting is making that interactive, involving the human in the process. So the human gets to choose what images the computer sees here and have a, a, a part in creating something new, which is really cool. I've got a video of this sort of happening. I wonder if, what we're going to see there. Whoops. Just... Oh, I lost it for a minute. I'll be back there in a minute. Give me two seconds. Okay. What? Not the wrong, wrong video. Here's a, here it is. Learning to see by Mimo Atkin. You can see um, there's a video playing of, of someone moving these objects around and the, the computer system catching up with the, the different, <laughs> different forms uh, here. Funny objects, uh, cleaning cloth, a pair of headphones. Oh, it's not a headphone, it's a microphone and a USB charger and a hand. And there's different different output images that are possible, ones like a flaming ruin, etc. So that is uh, that is Mimo Atkins learning to see a really fascinating interactive AI generative artwork. Here's another fascinating one. This is um, an artwork by Dilpreet Singh called Art or Not. Um, in fact, Dilpreet is Australian. He was working at a um, at Monash University in a, a lab called Sensi Lab, where they were exploring different kinds of AI systems. Let's just see if I can get a video of that one. I should have loaded the videos before and put them in the slides, but I didn't. Oh well, I can't find a video. But I'll tell you how this works. <laughs> Dilpreet used a, um, uh, again, an image classification system to choose, look at a picture through the, the lens of a smartphone and choose whether it was art or not. And so he trained it on some pieces of art and trained it on some images that were not art. And you point up this, the smartphone at a picture or something you're seeing and it tells you if it's art or not. Wouldn't that be handy if we had such a thing and it worked, but obviously it will do the job, it will tell you stuff, but it won't, it won't have any of the complex decision making which we understand as humans when we're evaluating artworks and understanding what's behind them, what the context is for the creator, what the context is for the viewer, what the process of experiencing that artwork is, what all of its qualities are that we've learned in this course. Um, this art, this system doesn't know that, it just knows from examples that some things look like art and some things don't. Uh, and sometimes it can even tell you where a picture came from, stockphoto.com. Um, yeah, a very interesting idea, the Art or Not app. And now, um, another concept, this, let's make sure the volume is working in that one. I think it's, yeah, it's not playing the desktop volume, that's good. 
This is um, an, a Norwegian computer scientist called Benedicta Wallace, uh, who's actually a friend of mine. And she's created a system called a dance generation neural network. So she's been working with dancers and recording, um, recording how dancers interpret um, sound and dance freely in an environment. And she uses motion capture to capture very carefully the motions of dancers as they're, they're creating their artwork. And what she's done is, is created a neural network that can generate endless dances, or exploring how to create that, dances that react to sound in certain ways or that just create dances forever by themselves. And then she animates them and creates these interesting um, generated dance artworks. So hopefully one day we can load up um, Benedicta's dance algorithms in P5.js and play with those as well, because it's a, a really fascinating different kind of generative AI, which we don't often see, animating human motion with AI. Cool. So further watching, there's, I've got a few links for you. You can check out if you're interested, artificial intelligence art, see what's happening in this today. It's, it's a field which has really sprung up over the last three or four years or become much more widespread and much more discussed in work uh, in the world. Another th uh, thing you can look at is this AIartists.org page, which includes a lot of tools and um, profiles of different artists. You can use that to get some inspiration or see what's happening in the field. And I showed you this, this uh, another time was this example of a generative artwork creating paintings of Australia. And folks, that brings us to the end. The end. Uh, we made it. <laughs> it's been a journey, hasn't it? It's been a journey of the last 13 weeks and you've got one more week to go to finish your major project. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming on this journey with me. And particularly uh, those of you who've really engaged with the online uh, lectures and been with me every single week, put your, your, um, your comments in the chat. I'm, I'm thinking, um, Jean, Avery, Spike's been there a lot, Songshen's been there a lot, um, many others, Bowen, whoa, I've got a long list, Cecilia's been there many times, um, I'm, I'm forgetting many names, but Chenfei has been there, yeah, so many folks, Ali has been, been with us many times for these lectures, and it's just been wonderful to interact with you live. I know that it's been a difficult semester for many of us, in particularly in Australia, because of the lockdowns that have occurred over the last few weeks. Life is starting to feel a bit more normal now, but of course I'm still working from home and streaming lectures to you. But I know that it's extra effort to, to tune in live to lectures, so I really appreciate that for those who did. For those who are watching the lectures later, I appreciate that as well. I, I make these lectures for you and, and create them so that you have a resource to get your mind up and running with, with comp 1720 slash 6720. I'd just like to say a few extra things. What you might do next now that you've, now that you've worked through this course with me, comp 1720 slash 6720, maybe you wanna do some more creative coding. And I can suggest that if you do, think about the ANU Laptop Ensemble. This is a course which we run in the School of Computer Science in how to make music with your computer and do so in a group situation. It's quite a different course than 1720. We, we usually only have a few students, uh, less than 20, and we, we work every week in making music together with our computers. So go to the website, there's a link in the slides, or you can just Google for ANU Laptop Ensemble. There's a, a video of our most recent um, concert in, in 2021, June. Um, the next time we run this course, this is actually a, a former 1720 student made this, this piece of music. Um, Skip to something else, you can go and listen to that and hear the sounds later. It's a, a very tight-knit group of folks who, who do that course. It's, it's a really wonderful experience. The next time we're running that is in semester 2, 2022, so this time next year. A new laptop ensemble. If you're a computer science student, and particularly if you're thinking about going uh, doing an honors project if you're a Bachelor of Advanced Computing student or if you're a master's student and you want to do projects, think about coming to do one with me. I've got my profile page here. Um, look at the things that I do. 
I'm particularly interested in supervising projects for folks who've completed Comp 1720 or 6720. They've done their major project and they're ready to take their art making to the next stage and, and go somewhere really exciting. Maybe explore music, maybe explore machine learning more with their art making. Um, but you've got the, the foundation for creating art with your computer now, creating interactive art. And we can then take it on into a research project related to it, which will be really fun. Um, and that's all I got. So I wonder if there's any other questions. I see a few folks have been um, putting in info. Gene was looking at using GPT-3, but couldn't think of an idea that works with the theme. It's, it's a, it would be a fun one, definitely. Um, but yeah, making using AI in that, in that area would be tricky. I, I don't know about using GPT-3. I think it would be more fun to use one of the crappier ones, actually. It's fun to use AI in particular when you have the possibility of um, of detecting that it's a, an artificial system, not uh, that it's a perfect system. Um, I guess one last thing before we go. Oops, just to open that up on my other computer. One last thing before we go. It doesn't look like there's any any further questions, but. I'm just going to do a quick shout out in the last lecture, a last lecture shout out to my wonderful tutors. This course is partly me giving you this discussion every week, a couple of hours of discussion, but also the tutors are such an important part. They're the folks who you see every week, who grade your assignments, who work with you, who try to get you to think of more exciting ideas, more exciting interactions, and they work so hard for you. So. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Neve. Thanks, Razzie. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Ichen. And thanks, Yoon, who's the last one right at the end there. There's another background person, um, Brent, who is um, a former tutor of this course, who's worked a little bit on the back end for me this, this semester. So thanks, Brent, too. And with that, I might say goodbye to you folks. Leave me more discussions in the Discourse forum as you're deciding how to do your major project. Um, make sure that you um, work hard over the next week. I know week 12 can be a terribly stressful time, but you're, you have all the tools you need to do a great uh, piece of art in Comp 6720 or Comp 1720, whichever course you're in. And I will see you after the course finishes and show you a great um, online gallery of all of your major projects. So see you folks next time.